button. There we go. We're now officially recording. So everybody, I wanted to say thank you very much again. Mr. Asadorian is on with us. So since we're now recording for the people that are here for the recordings, Mr. Asadorian, please say hi. Hi, this is uh, Paul Asadorian from Paul.com. Or as he likes to call it, the real Paul.com. And uh, right. this, is, this webcast is, is very, very unique. Um, and, and I think Paul and I are probably more excited about this webcast than we've been with a lot of the other ones in the past just because it is unique. And it is also very, very strange. Um, this is a defensive-based webcast. Uh, we talk a lot about offensive capabilities, you know, how to break into computer systems. That's really what we do at Paul.com Security Weekly and Black Hills Information Security. So we're going to be talking about some defensive tactics. How can we actually work for taking back the desktop and some environments? And as always, we really try to focus on solutions that you guys can implement. You can implement relatively quickly in your environment. But all of that isn't really why we're excited. We're excited because it's a bit strange, because this is brought to you by, of course, Black Hills Information Security. If you're looking for a uh, pen test, please contact us at consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to get myself, Tim Tomes, uh, Ethan, Joff, Mike, and of course, Paul as a Dorian working on your next penetration test. But it's also brought to you by Symantec. And uh, it was funny when we first did this, um, we had a couple of people that, that thought we were joking about it. Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about how we ended up kind of getting started down the path with Symantec? Um, yeah, I don't remember exactly. I'm not sure how, how relevant it is, but you know, we're very um, thankful to have Symantec as a sponsor for the webcast, and we've been working with their, uh, some of their product and product marketing folks, and you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this webcast because I think that a lot of what I see in security with respects to products is people will talk about products. And obviously, my day job, I work for Tenable's Network Security, right? So a lot of people will say things about products and um, how they are not maybe using them in the right way. So I'm excited to talk about uh, product features that can really help you and help solve your problems. And you know, I, I think hats off to Symantec for, for stepping up and um, putting themselves in that spotlight. You know, I, I, I like to highlight features and products that I think can really help people, and you will always get that uh, from John and myself, and this is an opportunity to hear that. Absolutely. So let's jump in. So as we said, the name of this presentation is Taking Back the Desktop. Um, and, I, and I think, Paul, this is pretty much, uh, without question, the hardest issue in computer security today. Um, when we're doing pen tests, like we just got done, I think you went down to uh, Tennessee or Texas for one. And anytime we can get access to a desktop, anytime we can get a user to click a link, the desktop usually is the weakest link in the overall armor of information security, but it's also the most important. Uh, a yeah, lot of organizations. It, it, it's, it's interesting, John. I'm actually working on some slides for another presentation, and I, in maybe five or six slides, can take people from attacker gets on your network however that may be, to domain admin in like, like five or six easy steps. And that's a reality. And I think that's why that particularly defending your desktops and not just some of your desktops, not just 95% of your desktops, right? 100% of your desktops in systems need that protection because it's not just your most critical ones, right? It's not just your ones that are involved with your PCI compliance. It's not just the ones used by your finance department. It's all of your desktops. And I think that's what makes it more challenging and more important to understand how to best uh, defend your desktop. Absolutely. And I think another problem when we're talking about protecting the desktops is when we talk to a lot of our customers, they say we have 20,000 nodes, we have 40,000 nodes, we have 100,000 nodes. And they really don't look into the idea of segmentation. They think they look at a huge number and they think that they need to find a solution that works for all 100,000 nodes. And that's kind of one of the themes we're going to talk about in this presentation today is that a lot of people, they start looking for products that will work for absolutely everything. And what happens is a lot of vendors will give us very generic vanilla solutions that can then be configured and modified to do amazing things. But out of the box, a lot of vendors are going to kind of play it safe. They're not going to do something that's going to break a lot of functionality because that's a surefire way to get your product kicked out of an environment. But a lot of the products that are out there have good features. It's just sometimes those features are buried very deep in the product as well. I also, I also like this, this picture of this computer. I put in finally a computer that hackers don't want. 
And I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of people on the webcast today that look at that and they remember actually using that particular computer system. So if anybody wants to type in into their questions what type of computer that is, that would be very cool because I know that some of you um, actually have used that exact computer. So if anybody wants to type that in and share that with the uh, rest of the group. There we go. I'm going to give it to, hold on, we had a whole bunch of people typing in. Uh, Keith was actually the first one. Keith uh, Fowler got it right. TRS-80, or some people call it a trash 80. So very, very, very good. Now, the other thing that's funny is I know a lot of you guys being pen testers, uh, we have people like Steve that said would love to have a copy of it, um, would love to actually get one of those uh, as quickly as possible. And then John Hoyt brought up, actually, John, um, the class right now, just so you know, the class that I'm teaching is active defense. And right now, the class, Mr. Hoyt, is going through your PowerShell script as part of active defense. So, you know, that's that's pretty cool. So glad to have you on with us today. But yeah, a lot of people would like to have one of those because they're not as easy to find as they once were. So yeah, if we can't defend the desktop, all else is lost. As we said, we're going to have another webcast coming up here in a little bit. It's going to basically document how to go from a workstation to full domain admin in like a few easy steps. And that's going to be a part of our webcast series, basically self-assessment and kind of doing self-pen testing. So you can do a lot of these things before a pen testing company comes in and tries to do them and just kind of embarrasses the security team. So let's talk about coverage. What are we going to be going over? Uh, first, we're going to be talking about Doug Burks and more security onion goodness. We're going to be talking about breaking internet whitelisting. Uh, if you listen to Paul.com on a regular basis, you know that I'm a huge advocate of internet whitelisting on a, on a regular basis, right? So with that, um, you know, we're, we're going to show you some ways to get around some internet whitelisting because yes, there are great value. There's great value to actually doing that, but there's still some limitations with it as well. And then we're going to close out and we're going to talk about Symantec and ampl application whitelisting. Um, we'll talk about the whole setup and the whole story with Symantec coming on and doing stuff with Paul.com, which we're very happy about. So the first thing was Doug Burks and I were hanging out the other night here in Augusta, Georgia. I was giving a presentation um, at the local ISSA. And one of the cool things, Paul, is, you know, at Paul.com, a lot of times you'll say on the show, you'll say, hey, I really wish I had a tool that did X. And then usually it's like, what, within a day or two, you end up getting that tool sent to you, right? Yeah, it, it's so bad at this point that sometimes I, I'll say, I wrote a tool that does X. And then like a week or two later, someone will say, well, you know, someone wrote a similar tool here and someone else wrote a similar tool there, which is kind of funny. Yeah, and almost always Dave Kennedy is involved somehow, which we find <laughs> somehow he's, he's from the future. <laughs> so oh. we find that a bit a bit disturbing. All right, so one of the first steps, Paul, and we were, we've been talking about this quite a bit, like when we were at RSA, is the idea of software inventory. How can we actually do software inventory in an organization effectively, so we can identify the software that's installed on all of our systems? And I said, Doug, you know, it'd be really, really cool if there was a tool that could do a packet capture and then based on that packet capture, automatically go through and identify um, installed software in the environment. I mean, no nothing too terribly crazy, but you know, looking at user agent strings from browsers, of course, but also looking at the software that's installed of individual applications would be even cooler as well. And uh, Doug just looked at me and he goes, it's in there. Uh, apparently this is a core feature in Bro. And I also know there's probably a lot of people that are on the webcast are like, well, of course, Bro does that. We, we've known about that for a long time. So um, we, we didn't quite know about that. And uh, it was very, very cool to see that. And for some reason, my screen just flickered out of existence. There we go. Bring it back up. So this is a really cool piece of functionality that a lot of people tend to miss uh, whenever they're using a lot of these IDS systems. And if you're just getting involved in IDS and IPS, and dealing with log management, event log correlation, uh, the security onion is something you have to look into. Also, there's a really nice blog entry on it. As you can see, blog.bro.org uh, back in 2012 and monster logs. So what does it look like? Well, this is what it looks like. So I think it's in the, uh, it, it's actually called uh, software.log or software.txt. And it's going to go through and it's going to automatically log the time that's going to log the IP address. It's going to log the host, and then it's also going to log the actual name and the full user agent string. Now, that, that's really valuable because then you'll actually find out what software is installed. And in the packet capture that Mr. Burke sent me, 
It had a packet capture with all kinds of really, really fascinating little snippets and user agent strings. You can see there's an Apple TV, Microsoft Outlook Express. You have a Unity Video Lens Remote Scope. Um, Internet Explorer, of course, and the one in the bottom I thought was really cool was the UPnP VX work. And if you remember, Paul, wasn't it HD Moore that did a big write-up on the number of uh, UPnP systems that were vulnerable yeah, to remote? Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of vulnerabilities in UPnP. There's also a lot of vulnerabilities in the uh, IPMI stuff, uh, both of which you can catch on your network uh, by sniffing. So, John, why why do people care, uh, and how does this relate to taking back your endpoint and securing your desktop. Excellent. I think that's a really good point. You know, we've been talking about a couple of different things on Paul.com. One of those is, you know, doing full credentialed scans, right? We do full credentialed scans with your vulnerability assessment uh, scanner of choice, like using Nessus. So using Nessus allows you to log into the box and actually check the vulnerabilities and the versions of a lot of software. But let's say that you're in an environment where you maybe aren't allowed to do full credential scans or your hands are tied or management is doing a, you know, kind of a weird dance to stop you from doing the level of checks that you really want to do, how can you still get right, the level that, of quality? That's, that's still checking, John, but I guess what I was trying to get at is, is what are the threats, right? Oh, and I see. And if you look at some of the statistics, something like 70% of the vulnerabilities that are released in any given year are from third-party software. Yep. And I think that's probably now one of the more popular methods in which malware is going to leak on your system, right? I mean, that, that's really what it's, what it's coming down to is that software running on the systems not directly tied to the operating system or operating system updates is a vehicle where malware is leaking on your system. So in order to combat that threat, knowing what software is on your network is is a good start, right? Um, I like to tell people that you want this information to reduce your attack surface. If you come up with a list of, of software that you know should be on your network, you can look and see what other what people are installing that's not approved, um, that's outside of the scope of what you want to allow on your network, and deal with those exceptions. You know, it all comes right back down to you want to have a policy that defines um, you know, what it is you want to have uh, as far as security, and you have to have procedures that tell you how. These are tools that can help you implement both of those things. And when you start identifying software that's on your network, uh, you know, I've run these similar kind of tools. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't, where did that come from? I didn't, it's like a whole bunch of like, holy crap, what's that? Holy crap, what's that? And you find all this stuff running in your network. And what you can do is, is reduce that attack surface so that when um, vulnerabilities come out for that software, they don't apply to you because you're not running it. And you can get ahead of the curve and help secure your endpoints that way and be proactive about it. Absolutely. And if you look here on the slide, I mean, we've got a bunch of examples of that, right, Paul? I mean, if we look down um, the Java, you know, we've got Java 1.6.0 underscore 05. I mean, that's pretty much a straight mainline into your environment. And what didn't we do a new segment a couple of weeks ago? What was the percentage of environments that have fully patched and up-to-date Java installations? Wasn't it like three or something ridiculous? Yeah, it was a ridiculously low number of people had to fully patch Java. And, yeah. um, you know, I, th I think a lot of that is that Java can hide in multiple applications. You get multiple copies of Java running and not, you know, when you log into the system to go patch it, you may not catch all of them. You know, applications will install an older version of Java uh, without, you know, maybe with the user knowing it, but not tell the IT department about it, right? And yep. then sometimes the only way to find these things is to actually sniff the network and see if, you know, that old version of Java is looking to update um, or going out to check an update server. And most software does that. Yeah. And then if you go one up to the right, you can see that we have BitTorrent clients that are running. Yep. And, and that's just pretty much a main line for evil in your environment, for people doing peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and breaking in. So there's a lot that you can do just by sniffing the network and simply going through and categorizing what software is installed. And you're basically typing that against what is approved, what's not approved, and what is just outright evil, like peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use WMIC. Now, I, I know a lot of you in this class, you've been through SANS 504. And uh, so we've, we've gone through and we've done a lot of really cool things with SANS 504, Hacker Techniques, and Incident Handling 
over the past few months. Ed has just done a tremendous amount of work. And one of the things that we added in is the ability to do software inventory in your environment just simply using the command line, right? So we, how do we use that in the command line, not just on an individual system, but we can use that against a number of systems in our environment. Now, the uh, commands that we use in class in our new labs on day one, so if you remember SANS 504 day one was a lot of policy, process, procedure associated with uh, you know standard incident response procedures, but we've added in two separate new labs into SANS 504 day one, and one of them deals with, you think that there's an incident, you think you were exploited via, let's say, an Adobe Acrobat vulnerability, what other systems have that version of Adobe Acrobat? So this isn't just an issue of trying to defend our network against vulnerable applications, it's also an issue of incident response. So yes, yeah, sniffing traffic, great for finding vulnerable systems, but we can also go through and say, look, it looks like somebody exploited us through Java, it looks like somebody exploited us through Adobe Acrobat, how many other systems do we have that have that version? So you can yeah. run now, from the now, now, John, uh, Gene brings up a, a question. He says, how does Bro compare with SCCM? I think it's a fantastic question. Um, there's really the two major reasons why you would want to use something like Bro to sniff your network for vulnerabilities in software and use that in conjunction with SCCM. So the first one is SCCM is taking care of systems that you know about. If you're going to manage a system with SCCM, you have to know that it's there, or it at least has to be part of your domain. Okay, so when you sniff the network for things like vulnerabilities and software, you're going to get the systems that aren't participating in your SCCM management process, or maybe aren't even part of your domain, right? But they're on your network. Um, the other thing is that software tends to hide on a system, and the best example I can give of that is if a user is running a desktop, for example, or even an administrator is running a server, and they want some other application, but it runs in a virtual machine, and that virtual machine is not part of your domain and not part of um, your network management platform, then that virtual machine is going to run software that you may know, not know about as well. But by sniffing the network and looking for this information, you get the entire picture of what's happening. Yeah. That's a great question. No, it is. It is. So it, it kind of goes back to what we've talked about quite a bit. You know, in security, it's not just an issue about the things that you know about, but you should be constantly trying to identify the things you don't know, like the rogue workstations, the rogue virtual machines, the notebook computer that's been underneath somebody's desk since 2008, and they plug it into the network, and now you have a whole bunch of vulnerabilities. And I think that's where the sniffing really shines. That, and the other thing is, you know, I can install Bro in a matter of like 15 minutes with uh, Security Onion. Um, SCCM is not something you can stand up very quickly. I used to feel really stupid for not being able to get it up and running very quickly, but then I talked to Carlos about it, and I think Carlos started crying a little bit when I was asking about his SCCM instance, and uh, I decided I would just leave well enough alone. And if something makes Carlos cry, it means it's probably much more difficult than I want to implement. So let's go through these commands. As you guys know, we love Windows Management Instrumentation Command. So we can use WMIC, product, git name, comma, version. If you guys are playing around at home, you guys can type this in right now. Just be sure that you're running as administrator for Windows 7, Windows Vista, and Windows 8 computers. So that's neat. I mean, Paul, we can pull down the version of software. We can get the name of that software. That's really cool, but it's not really enterprise worthy, right? I mean, it's not something that we can run across all of our systems in our environment very quickly. So we can do WMIC space forward slash node, which means we're going to run this WMIC command on a remote computer system. But this is interesting because we're not specifying the computer system shortly after that parameter. We're specifying at systems.txt. Now what that's going to do is it's going to run the exact same command on every single system that is in that systems.txt file. So we can pull down product, get description, name, vendor, um, get description, name, and vendor. And then we're giving the output format a CSV. So we're going to pull it down in a format that can be easily parsed in a number of different formats. We can load it into a database, load it into Excel spreadsheet. It's really up to you. And then we're outputting that into a file called softwareinventory.txt. So really a cool bit of value to kind of run something very quickly. And as I said, this isn't just something you would do as a defender trying to identify software that's in your environment. You would also use it as an incident responder because many times we forget to pull back and find the root cause of the incident. How do we get exploited in the first place? And then trying to eradicate that cause from all of our systems. So this is what it looks like. Some, some things that are really cool about it. One, each of the system names 
will be prefaced on each line. So you can see I have Charlie, TV, Veruca, um, Veruca Salt, TV, as you guys know from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And you can see that we quickly were able to identify multiple different systems which were vulnerable to remote exploits through Adobe Reader 9.1. .9 and you know it's vulnerable just simply because it says Adobe Reader. So it leads itself to be compromised. <laughs> compromised very easily. So so some really cool ways you can get a grips on understanding and actually knowing what is on your network and then trying to eradicate the vulnerable software as quickly as possible. All right, Paul, I think you'd like to talk a little bit about passive vulnerability ass assessment scanning. I think this is one of those basement technologies that we don't hear a lot about. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. It's kind of a departure from what normally people do for vulnerability assessment scanning. Yeah, so some of my work in my day job, I, I work with a product and, and have been since 2009 um, that can passively detect vulnerabilities on the network, uh, very much in the same way that uh, John spoke about when he talked about Bro and using uh, signatures. So really any IDS um, that is looking at the network traffic can also look at that traffic and look for vulnerabilities. Um, the product that I've been working with uh, is called the Passive Vulnerability Scanner. Uh, just a couple of more little pieces of information about that particular technique. Um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, is that just about every piece of software you install on your system eventually talks out to the internet. And it does that to get updates for its product or you know just a function of the software. It talks out to the internet in that communication. A lot of the time, probably 90% of the time, it's leaking which version it's running. From that information, you can determine if something's uh, vulnerable from that. Now, when you talk about placement, you're like, well, you know, I have got this thing that's going to sniff my network for vulnerabilities. Where do I put it? Uh, I always recommend that people put it on the inside of their firewall or whatever device that allows your network to talk out to the Internet. You'll get most of your uh, traffic that you want to look for vulnerabilities by putting it at that choke point where everything talks out to the internet. Now I know people's network architectures are going to be drastically different, but as a general rule of thumb, you know, any device, any uh, port on your switch, right, that's all your internet traffic is going through, even most of your internet traffic is going through, is a great place to start um, sniffing for that. So a little story, um, as John mentioned, we do a weekly podcast. Uh, it's essentially, uh, essentially a, you know, an internet radio show. Uh, I'm sure several of you are, are, are listeners as well. Um, where a bunch of my friends, you know, people in security, we converge, we interview people, we have got have conversations about security, but people come to my, my house, my studio, and they use my network to gain access to the internet uh, every week. So these are security professionals, and I have uh, the passive vulnerability scanner running on my network. Now last week, I caught every single person who visited my house running some piece of vulnerable software. Um, that includes my good friend Jack Daniel, who uh, was helping me configure some of the software. That includes myself, where I figured out I had a vulnerable version of Flash running, right? I fired up a different browser. It tried to initiate Flash. It said, hey, your version of Flash is vulnerable when you're using Firefox. Uh, I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. I caught people running wait older a, versions of... Wait a minute, of, Paul. Um, so hold on a second. So... If you normally use like Safari or you used a different browser, they were using different versions of Flash based on the separate browsers that were on your environment? Yeah, I found that to be the case with not just Flash but Java as well, um, that yeah. the different browsers or different, even different applications that have some kind of um, way to interpret Flash or Java will sometimes come bundled with their own versions. And that's where we get into the, you know, why this is, one of the reasons why this is a great thing to have on your network is because these versions tend to hide like that. Uh, I know, for example, my RSS reader will also have, you know, maybe its own um, Java uh, engine built into it as well. So there can be multiple applications. Uh, keeping up to date with your web browser, I find is a, a constant challenge as well. I've covered vulnerabilities for the past, you know, eight years and there's always new updates to browsers, and it doesn't, for whatever reason, the software just does not want to always tell you when that should happen. And I caught a lot of people that came to my house last week running a vulnerable version of Firefox because the update mechanism just hadn't uh, told them to update yet, um, or if it did, they missed it, or whatever the, the configuration issues are. Um, so now, along those lines, this uh, particular... Um, 
software can also detect malware, right? I mean, malware talks on the network and presents a certain signature as well. Um, so if you've got something like Poison Ivy running, you know, that puts out a particular traffic pattern that you can catch with, you know, Bro or with the, you know, the passive vulnerability scanner. So, you know, and um, Jared uh, brought up a, a good, a good point. Uh, he, he basically said Chrome comes with its own version of Flash. And he also thinks that um, Internet Explorer on Windows 8 does as well. So it's got its own ver version that's actually built into it. Yeah, I've, I've definitely, I knew about the Chrome thing because there are certain applications that require Flash that I know work well with Chrome, but not with other browsers on certain platforms. So, you know, that can be an indication that uh, something is including its own version. And also, Sebastian just asked you a question. He says, is Paul running PVS as part of the Security Center suite at home, or is he using the not yet released standalone version? Uh, yeah, so the answer is I'm using the not yet released standalone version. Okay. And then Dan brought it up, and he's like, when is that going to be released? Um, soon. <laughs> soon. <laughs> It's probably Soon. one of those things Paul shouldn't have uh, talked about, and he'll no, be, no, it's fine. Yeah, we're, we're actively working on the release. He'll so. be docked five cigars next time he goes to work. All right. Uh, so that's yeah, uh, that's pretty much. Uh, we I think we covered that. We got a good coverage of passive vulnerability scanning. So let's move on. All right. So I got a bit of a trivia question for you guys. Um, I have an, an equation up on the slide right now, and I would like to see if anybody can tell me what that equation does, okay? What does that equation actually do? And when we get to the end of this slide, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about what it is if no one's actually answered the question yet, but the hint is pi. All right, so internet whitelisting is awesome. I mean, I, I talk about this all the time, and sometimes, Paul, you and I get into arguments, right? And one of those arguments is you, you kind of accuse me, and I think justifiably so, that I look at it as kind of a panacea, right? I'm always saying, you know, this is a solution. We should do internet whitelisting as much as possible. And uh, I've had a couple of people bring me up on that as well. So internet whitelisting is, in fact, awesome. Unless, of course, you're ident unless it is that you're on a, uh, a pen test. And then things can get a little bit uncomfortable. And by the way, the uh, big award goes to Jared yet again. Uh, Jared was able to get the answer for the equation, but we're still uh, waiting for some of the correct answers. Um, Antonio, no, it does not divide by zero. Um, so... <laughs> So, uh, so internet whitelisting is awesome, right? I, I think it's great, and I don't necessarily think it's a solution to everybody's problems, but I think it's something that we definitely need to look into. And I, I guess, Paul, I haven't told you this, but this is this. These next few slides are, are me kind of telling you that yes, it is not a solution to all of our problems in information security. So we have a tendency, Paul, uh, of getting customers that actually listen to our show, right? Oh, he's gone now. We do. <laughs> So, so they listen to our show and they implement what we're talking about. And, and the thing that sucks about that is, is we get these people and there's like, yeah, we listen to Paul.com all the time. We want you to come in and do a pen test. Woo, awesome. And we do everything you guys tell us to do, which is kind of uncomfortable, I suppose. Um, so we had a customer that basically approached us like that. He's like, we're really excited about you guys coming in, doing the pen test. And I, I sent poor Ethan on this pen test and Ethan shows up. And he has no idea what he's getting into. So he gets to the environment and they have internet whitelisting and it works really, really, really well. It works exceedingly well. Now we'll talk about how Ethan was trying to use it here in just a couple of seconds, some of the vulnerabilities that he discovered for trying to bypass the internet whitelisting product. Um, but before we move on, um, we had Jared got the right answer. Um, Argyle said recursion. And then Chris said, the number is a prime number. And no, it's not. All right. So just so you guys know, because we're upping the geek quotient for people that attend these uh, these podcasts or these webcasts. Anyone here in the room know what this formula does? A series to generate pi was one answer. Um, that's not it. Mark Baggett. Oh, because I because I geeked out about it last night, right? So I'm at Mark Baggett's house last night. I was geeking about this whole entire thing. So he's now writing a Python script to do it. Um, so what Jared said that was absolutely right um, was uh, Aji. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Um, uh, Jared said it will calculate any position of pi without having to calculate every single preceding value of pi. So up until fairly recently, if somebody wanted to calculate what the four trillionth value of pi is, 
they would have to calculate every other preceding value of pi to actually get to find out what the four trillionth value of pi is. And this particular formula kicks it straight in the teeth. This particular formula will calculate any position of pi without having to brute force every single position before it. Um, now, this deals into something called NP hard problems in mathematics. There's a lot of problems in mathematics where the only solution we know is by brute forcing the said solution, and this allows us to solve the solution elegantly. What does it have to do with internet whitelisting? Some problems that my, are... That was my question. There we go. So there's two things about this. One, internet whitelisting is hard. It's not difficult. It's not something that you can easily implement in your environment. It still would be an NP hard problem. You'd have to put a lot of work and a lot of effort. We don't have an elegant solution to Pi. The other reason why I desperately kind of shoehorned this into my class, Paul, and I know that Mr. Mike Poor would love this, is in order to solve this particular problem with Pi, they moved away from base 10 mathematics and they had to use hex to be able to solve it. So this type of mathematics, as you can see, you have the 1 over 16K uses hex in order to successfully solve the problem. So it, it really is a contrived way to work this formula in, but I think it's awesome. And it articulates how some things in life are usually brute force, but we come up with elegant solutions. Internet whitelisting is not one of those yet. And I also like to throw in little geeky kind of challenges for people that attend these particular, uh, these particular uh, webcasts as well. All right, so what happened? So as I said, it turns out some internet whitelisting providers support something called regular expressions. Now, if you spend a lot of time working in IT security, regular expressions are a way that we can define a filter so we can match on certain string sets and numeric values to basically filter through a lot of unstructured data to pull out the data that is useful to us by identifying patterns. So here's the problem. A lot of these tools will allow you to whitelist domains. So let's say that you work at hackedcompany.com. Okay. And if you're implementing internet whitelisting, you're going to let your users go to business related sites. Let's say, you know, they're trying to go to hacked company or they're trying to go to hackedcompany2.com or a business provider or they're trying to go to an application. You would create an internet whitelisting for that URL. So, so far it's pretty straightforward. But whenever you're trying to create a whitelist for an entire domain, it gets a little bit dicey because if you're trying to establish a regular expression filter, position is almost completely impossible to establish within a URL because you may have like HTTP colon forward slash forward slash mail dot hacked company dot com or you might have HTTP colon forward slash forward slash VPN dot hacked company dot com www dot hacked company dot com so you're trying to filter everything for hacked company dot com basically whitelisting an entire domain of your computer systems but positionally that's not going to be something that's easy to do and then also trying to go and create an entry for every single one of those entries would be very, very cumbersome and time consuming. So what happens is a lot of these different internet whitelisting utilities will actually just use a regular expression to match that domain anywhere in the URL. So whether or not it's VPN, www, or you know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious.hackedcompany.com, as long as that string exists someplace in the URL, it's going to whitelist it. And that's actually what we kind of took advantage of. And I'm sure that other people have done this before, but it's new to me and I think it's cool. So how exactly do, did this stop us on a pen test? Well, how this application white layer, internet whitelisting product was stopping us was our C2 channels. So we were running into a tremendous amount of difficulty getting command and control out of the environment. They didn't have any open ports on their uh, standard workstations. So you just couldn't simply put in an IP address and use like port 8080 to get out because everything was locked down and it had to go through HTTPS or port 80 and it had to go through a proxy and they were doing full interception of the SSL. So it was stopping our command and control, our, our malware that we've created from going out. So we tried it with Metasploit, no dice. HTTPS, no dice. Straight up HTTP, no dice. So we had to go to our own malware that uses clear text HTTP and encodes it inside of the payload someplace as our C2 channel. But we had to come up with a way that our malware could successfully talk outbound from the environment. So how do we do it? So here's what would happen whenever we tried to connect to our, let's say, our command and control server. So if you tri simply tried to surf to our command and control server, as you can see the .179 address, we would get this error. It would say this page cannot be displayed based on your corporate access policies. Access to this website, you know, our IP address, the web category uncategorized URLs is not allowed. 
If it's required, please contact the help desk. Well, of course, Ethan didn't want to try and contact the help desk to try to get the command and control working, so he had to get a little bit creative. So what he was able to find out is if you had the domain of the company anywhere in the URL, it would allow you out. So you can see that we're doing a Google search and we're doing minus targetcompany.com space kittens, and it would allow it to go through. Now, Google was not an allowed whitelisting or whitelisted site. However, simply because the target organization's URL or domain was in the request, it allowed it to blow right through. And you could go to any site that you wanted. Um, so I'm sure that there's some people that are at work, they're like, no, I can surf porn without anybody looking over my shoulder. Um, no, that's not the reason why we're showing you this, but we're showing you that, yes, even things like internet whitelisting have inherent limitations of it as well. So how would this work for our command and control and actually connecting to our command and control server? So what we were able to do is actually set it up so you could provide a parameter of the target environment. As you can see, we have our 179 address forward slash question mark blah. And then the target domain or the domain that we were trying to come out of and it allowed us to go through. So based on this, we were able to take our backdoor our custom malware that we wrote. It uses straight up HTTP with the encoding of the actual command and control covertly hidden inside of it. And then provide the organization's domain as a parameter anywhere. And you can just throw it away and it blew right through the application whitelisting product. So we're showing this for two reasons. One, because we think it's a vulnerability. Once again, I'm pretty sure that there's people that have identified this at some point in the, uh, in, in the past. Um, so oh, somebody said, I use this exception for domain whitelisting, and he's basically allowing in Google.com. Oh, very cool. So I'm sure that people have seen this, but it, it, it's basically to show that, yes, there are limitations to things that are as cool as internet whitelisting whenever it comes to trying to lock down and secure an environment. So be aware of that. As we said, and when we do these webcasts, we're going to try to sneak in what we're getting on a couple of web, set, uh, web pen tests and standard pen tests as we move forward. So, so that was a lot of fun. All right, so now on to the meat of this, particular, um, of this particular webcast. So this was strange. So we got a call from Symantec. Uh, Mr. Mike Perez was going out trying to find sponsors for webcasts and somehow got in contact with the marketing department of Symantec and as you guys know, Paul.com, we're very heavy into pen testing. We're very heavy into bypassing AV engines to replicate what the bad guys do. And we've also been spending a lot of time talking about how traditional blacklisting is something I don't want to say is completely dead, but it is not enough from an overall security architecture. So many organizations hang their hat on just blacklists. That's it. But there's so much more that you can actually do to try and set up a good security policy as far as what types of applications are allowed to run. So they came and they said, we wanted to sponsor a webcast. So we said, you know, we're a bit shocked. We're pen testers. This is what we do. And it turns out that they said, no, we understand that. We really want you to talk about some of our um, kind of reputational based um, AV and then also some whitelisting. And what really got us interested is whenever the uh, marketing people said, we want to talk about how there's limitations in blacklisting technologies. And, and, I, and Paul, this really kind of floored us, right? Um, it's, for a little while, we thought it was a joke, um, but it wasn't. Really, honestly and truly, Symantec wanted to talk about limitations of blacklisting and how we can move beyond that. And like I said, put in reputational-based AV. We can start talking about internet whitelisting. We can start talking about application whitelisting and really try to make a fundamental impact in organizations that are trying to be more secure. So we were really just fascinated that Symantec Endpoint Protection supports whitelisting. It was awesome, cool, scary, all at the same time. Like I said, it's like bacon ice cream as well. And they said they wanted us to talk about features that people tend not to turn on, which was another. Yeah, and I, well, I, I think that's a key, a key point, John. You know, in our penetration tests in the past, um, where we've had to get around numerous defensive technologies, a lot of the our recommendations after the test come down to, you know, we're not going to go around telling people, well, you know, we bypassed your defensive technologies, whatever those may be, firewalls, IPS, antivirus. You know, you just should get rid of all those because they don't work. That's absolutely not what we say, right? We make recommendations to say architecturally where your defensive technology should be and also more importantly how they should be configured to prevent our attacks. And oftentimes when we're able to bypass a defensive technology, we work with the customer and make the recommendation, hey, 
you've got these other features, you've got this other configuration. If you configure it and tune it this way, it'll prevent those attacks. And it, you know, I, I think that's the constructive um, work that we like to do with customers, and we want to be able to share that with our community as well. That you may already have technologies that can help improve your defenses significantly. You just need to learn about the features and learn about the different configurations, learn about the updates that come to those products in order to use them more effectively. And, and I think that that's a good point. A lot of people, and we, we you know, and Paul, we're, we're guilty of this as well. On our show, we rip on AV companies all the time because they say their products are, we say their products are ineffective. They're not catching these types of attacks. And, and I think that one of the things I've learned in the past couple of weeks is a lot of these AV vendors, and Symantec is a great example of that, they try to tune things down to where most organizations can run their product with the least amount of impact to the organization. And it really is incumbent upon us, the consumers, to try to turn on the features that make these things better, right? And the reason why these, these companies are basically providing the products in the state that they are is because if they actually turned them on so they were completely 100% effective, they would lose a lot of customers because it would require their customers to turn on something or require them to tune it for specific applications and specific systems. And, and I think that all of us, it's kind of our responsibility as defenders to look at the capabilities in our products and try to enable them as much as possible. And this, and just so you guys know why, we're it, why we were so gun shy with Symantec contacting us, if you remember about a year and a half, two years ago, um, we gave a presentation where we were talking about AV vendors and uh, myself, Rob Lee, Tim Tomes were rewriting the forensics labs in, uh, in, in SANS, right? The 508 forensics labs. And we used uh, uh, McAfee for that lab. So we went through, used McAfee, bypassed McAfee, and then Rob Lee wrote a blog post about it. And then immediately McAfee got us on the phone. And, and the thing that really bothered me is McAfee was not concerned about trying to make things better when we were on that phone call. McAfee just didn't really care about that. They were far more interested in the impact of their overall market share. And that was really devastating to me. I, I mean, I, I took that personally because we were going to give them a bunch of recommendations that they could use to try to make their product better. And instead, it was always kind of this veiled threat that lawsuits were going to be coming about because of defamation and just simply because we were talking about limitations of what their product actually did. So, yeah, we get gun shy when AV companies contact us just by the nature of what we do. So simply by having Symantec contact us and simply by having them be willing to work with us and talk about features in their product that weren't just traditional blacklisting and getting kind of the word out. It's kind of a breath of fresh air. And by the way, everything we're going to talk about here is at this link. So you guys can see the how to on how to set this up in your environment as well. So I was a bit shocked. So I wrote up this, uh, this, this email and I still haven't gotten a response, Paul, from the CEO of Symantec. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit bummed about that. That, that, that scares me a little bit that they, they are ignoring my, uh, my emails. But I basically said, your marketing team has been taken over. Dear CEO of Symantec, as near as I can tell, your marketing team, or at least part of it, has been taken over by rational human beings. We are doing a webcast for your company. Thanks, by the way. And they want us to discuss rational, logical solutions to complex malware problems. You may have noticed the profound lack of marketing buzz phrases, such as the words as synergy, leverage, and return on investment from parts of your marketing team. That's okay. It seems, may seem odd at first, but I recommend you let this takeover happen. Because the more that we have people going through and, uh, and, and kind of sharing this information and talking rationally about these things, especially for marketing and sales teams, the better off that we're all going to be. So what did they share with us? Because if they were just sharing with us Symantec endpoint protection, um, here we go, this is our product and our product is awesome. That wouldn't be something that we would be doing a webcast. But they did talk about how they could use enabling of whitelisting. And they talked about it like the basement of neglected technologies. Uh, Paul, it almost seemed that they were pretty frustrated that a lot of people that they, they were working with, a lot of their customers weren't actually turning this on. And, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, I identify with that, with that frustration. You know, I've been working uh, in, with security products uh, for over 10 years now. Uh, and I've done that in a professional and still do that in a professional capacity. And I, I totally understand that you as a vendor – or you know, solutions creator will create a solution and to respond to feedback from your community, and it can be tough to get that message out um, and get people to use and understand the new product features or changes to product features or even ways to configure um, the products that are being released. Um, and you know, getting people to understand that can be can be a difficult challenge. So I I, I totally get that. 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I see it, you know, we're talking about defensively, right? I see it offensively too, is that as pen testers, a lot of times there's new techniques or updates to products coming out. And, um, I, you know, I think in the offensive technology, we maybe do a little better job of communicating, hey, there's this new technique out there and everyone gets excited about it. But for whatever reason, in a lot of the defense,